Take your Bibles and I turn to Philippians chapter 1, please. We've been studying through the book of Philippians on Sunday nights. We're going to look at chapter 1, verses 9, 10, and 11 tonight. <clears throat> There's a man by the name of John R. Rice who wrote the book on praying, asking, and receiving. Had the privilege of preaching with him some and having him in our church several times, but I always delighted when we got together and he would pray for me. I never will forget one of the first times that I had Dr. Jack Howells come and preach for me, that Travis was young then, and I introduced Travis to Dr. Howells, and I was surprised. He said, come here, son, let me pray for you. He took him in his arms and he prayed for him. How many of you are thankful that there are people that pray for you? Amen. Well, I'm grateful people pray for me, aren't you? It's an encouragement in my heart when someone says, I am praying for you. Well, how would you like it if the Apostle Paul was praying for you? Well, in this text, Paul is praying for these believers at Philippi. He's going to tell them what he's praying with them about. There are certain things he's going to pray for these people here. Now, there's one thing we know about this book, book of Philippians. It's a book about joy 16 times. In this passage of scriptures, rejoice or have joy in the Lord. So what in the world is the joy of his praying? And what it is, it's the joy of watching these new believers grow in Christ. I have no greater joy, John said, to hear my children walk in truth. And one of the greatest delights in the world is, if you know this, you got children, is you, you get to watch them grow. What a delight that is to do that. I know I, I, still, I still get excited at ball games when my grandkids play ball. And when my children played ball, it was different. I couldn't watch them. I'd have to go in the corner and pray. I'd have to, honestly, I'd have to go to the corner and, and, and didn't watch, but I'd go in the corner and I'd pray, God, help them, God, help them. Just, just, just pray for them. I don't know if God's interested in that or not, but I think he is. But uh, I'd pray for them. Now, my grandkids, I could stay a little bit more relaxed and watch them, you know, and enjoy them a little bit better, but I'd still pray for them too. But it's good to have, have people praying for you. Watching your children grow, what a delight it is particularly watching your grandchildren grow as well as we have and we have the privilege of doing. So what is it in this prayer that Paul is going to pray for these Christians at Philippi about them? Well, let's read it, then I'll give you five things very briefly. Chapter 1, verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere without offense on the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray that I'll be precise tonight. I pray tonight you'll speak to my heart and speak to the hearts of your people. Thank you for them, and thank you for your mercy, your love, your kindness, your good to us, goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me say to you, thank you for coming to church tonight. You didn't have to come. You could have done anything else in the world, but thank you for coming. I appreciate that. Paul was a great man of prayer. He prayed for lost people to be saved. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God for Israel is they might be saved. But you'll not find him praying for lost people in this passage of Scripture we're going to talk about tonight. He prayed for people to be healed, but you'll not find any of that in the writings of the book of Philippians. He prayed for many things. What he's going to pray for here is nothing to do in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense. He's going to pray for their spiritual being, something about the inner man he's going to pray for. The first thing he's going to pray for is, is found in verse number 9. Would you look at it with me? For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, verse 9. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in, judge, in all judgment. So the first thing he prays for is that their love may abound. Would you say that with me? That their love may what? Abound. Your love may abound. I think all of you in this room will agree with me that the greatest element of the Christian faith is the fact that we are greatly loved. And Christianity is based on the wonderful theme of love. And the matter of fact is, the Bible says this. There says three things about God. And one of those things about God is, is that God is love. There's no sublime words any sweeter than these little words phrased by a woman named of Anna B. Warren who wrote this little book, this little words, and you know it. Jesus loves me for the 
What great words in two little statements. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The most fascinating subject on earth is the theme of love. The very fact of heaven itself and all of eternity that I preached about this morning will be the theme of love. Why is love so important in the Christian's life? Why do we need to learn as believers to our love may abound and grow? Look with me, please, if you would, at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for a second. We call this the love chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, just for a few minutes. Look there with me, please. I'll try to be as brief as I can and give you just a few things. I may not preach the entire message tonight, just give you a part of it. 1 Corinthians 13, look how important love is. Are you in verse number one with me? If you are, say amen. amen. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and have not charity, and charity is our word for love, agape love, God's love. I am become as sounding brass or a tinking cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity falleth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity. He says, he says, but rejoice in the truth. Bears all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. So you see the importance. You know, everything you do, if we're going to do it properly, we've got to do it with love or charity. Will you say amen to that for me? Now, this love that we're talking about is our love for one another would abound more and more is a product of the Holy Spirit of God. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans 5, 5. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. In other words, when you got saved, the Holy Spirit came and lived inside of you and he placed the love of God in your heart. And honestly, if you'll listen to God and the Holy Spirit, he'll give you enough love to love everybody like you need to love them. He'll give you enough to love to love your enemies because the Holy Spirit of God has placed the love of God in your heart. He has done that for you. The fruit of the Spirit, the Bible says, is love, joy, peace, etc. in Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 20. But he's praying that your love may abound. And the reason for that, because love, see, we've been taught of God to love one another. God teaches me, I'm to love you. Can, can I get an amen to this? There's some people easier to love than others. Amen. But are we still yet to love each other? Come on, say amen to that. Yes, we are. We're taught of God to love one another. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed you do this toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Talking about increasing more in love. See, love, let me tell you something about love for a second. I, I talked to a young couple, got, I got four or five marriages coming up here, or weddings coming up pretty soon. I always laugh at this. You excuse me for being an old preacher when I do this. But I always make them ask me the question, said, preacher, will you marry me? And what do I always tell them? I always say, I'm already married. But I get the delight of telling them that. And they know I'm going to do that. They say, will you marry me? I say, I'm already married. But I said, it's the best offer I've had all day, all right? But the fact is that I teach them this very thing, that love is a choice. Is love not a choice? Come on, can you choose to love somebody if you really want to? Now, love also is an emotion. That's why it feels so good to love. But love also is a choice. You choose to love things. You choose to love people. You choose to love different things. But also, it's an emotion that you have. Love is so important because Jesus said this. He said, by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have what? Love one toward another. Let me ask you a question. Answer me now. So is, is our love abounding? Is it, is, it, is it important? Answer me. See, the Bible says in 1 John 3, 14, we know we've passed from death into life because we love the brethren. So love is important for us. Love shows the world something. A new commandment I give unto you, not as the world giveth unto you, that you love one another. Love is important. Love is sacrificial. We know the love of Christ. He sacrificed for us. This commandment I give unto you, John 15, 12, that you love one another as I have loved you. And the call upon husbands in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 25 is husbands to love your wives. Now the amazing thing about that, he didn't say love them if they was good. He said to love your wives. So the, the, there's importance 
the importance of us learning to love one another. Now, automatically when I say what I just said, people have the idea then, well, that just love, 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 love. But see, the Bible explains what the love is to be. It says that you love yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Love just doesn't say, I love you no matter what you do. Though we love all men, come on, we do not love what all men do. See, now here's where, the, here's, where the, here's where the difference comes in. A lot of people want to say, well, I love somebody, so no matter what I do, it's all right to do it. No, the Bible says you're to love in knowledge and judgment. I have literally had people come to me and say this to me, preacher, I'm going to leave my wife and I'm going to run off with some man, somebody else's wife because I love that person. No, you do not love them. You lust them. And you, and you can't justify loving something that's wrong when the Bible says it is wrong. You can't do that. That's not the love of God in perspective or in judgment or knowledge. And God says when you love something, you love it correctly and you love it, and you love it rightly because this is what God said. Listen to me just for a second, if I would, please. See, love is not gullible. Love looks at something and says, I can love this because it's God says I can love this. Would you agree with me that the love of God is, is far measurable than you and I could ever, amaz- could ever measure, ever know? I'm going to tell you, I, 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 get, I get frustrated with myself because I cannot express the love of God like I want to. And will you agree with me that the love of God is totally the vastest thing in all the world? Would you agree with me that God could love us, know everything about us and still love us? Isn't that amazing that he could do that? But would you also agree with me the love of God does not eliminate the very fact that there is a hell? Because even though God loves, and God is love, God is light, and God is holy. And God never sacrifices on the altar of lust or the altar of what is wrong, his love. His love is always right, but it's also right. And we have a perspective of what God's word has said, what is right and wrong, but what to love. And it does not eliminate the very fact that if people die without Jesus Christ, and I'm not being unkind, I'm not being nasty, I'm just telling to you, they die and go to hell without Jesus. That's a, that's, a, that's a terrible fact to go that way, having been loved by God's love and his mercy and grace. First thing he says, I want your love to grow. The second thing he says, I pray for your excellency, you, to you to excel. Look at verse number 10, that you may approve the things that are excellent. I'll make this as brief as I can. When he says that you may approve the things that are excellent, he's simply talking about this. He's talking about in the Christian life, in the Christian life, there are some things that are good for you, but some things are not best for you. Even in churches, you've got, or in schools you've got, even Christian schools you've got, you've got some people that you can run with that may be good for you, but you've got some that be better for you. And in the Christian life and Christian efforts that we give out, there are some things that are good for you, but there are some things that are best for you. And that's why you've got to pray for God to excel in that which is best for you. Can, can, I get a, can I get an amen to this? Our life is short. If we've got anything to do, we need to do it quickly, don't we? And do it rightly. I just uh, was talking to a preacher in, in Chicago this evening. The four national pastors that are here from Syria that's going to be in our church in Egypt and Iraq that are going to be here. You don't want to miss their testimonies. I, we, I, I planned it out so they could go to Chicago this week and be up at a church there in Chicago and then Indiana the next week. They're going to be here with us. But anyway, this pastor wrote me today uh, an email. He said, I want to tell you, he said, these men are men of great blessing to us. He said, there are men, said, they have been such a blessing to us already just this day to hear their testimonies, to hear what they've gone, what they've endured, what they've gone through. And so these men have given their lives to that which is best. You talk to some of these pastors when you see them, you, you'll hear them. And they've had to choose between that which is good or that which is best. And when you hear them, you're going to see there is a choice be made in our lives that we choose that which is best for our lives. Not necessarily because it's necessarily good, but what is best for us. That's what the Bible admonishes us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Listen to this verse of Scripture, Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, Holy, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Why well, don't tonight we pray, God, 
helped me to get to doing the best things in my life, not necessarily just good things in my life, the best things. Third thing, he prays for their integrity. Look at verse number 10 again, if you would please. He says that you may be approved things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. The idea is simply is this. The word sincere means something that's been sifted in a sieve and comes out and it's real fine. The word without offense means this. Watch, listen to me just for a second. What, without offense means this. What they did, they had pottery makers in, in biblical times that they would make pottery. And what they would do when they put that pottery in those kills to make them heat up, that sometimes they would crack. So what they would do when they went to sell the pottery, because they wanted to get more money out of the pottery, what they would do to get the pottery to sell it, someone would be a, a trickster would take wax and put it in the cracks in that pottery. And they would try to sell that pottery for it being the finest pottery there was with it being a cracking, but you couldn't see it because they'd take wax and put it in there. So what the word sincere means is, or without offense means this. What, what a man would do if he bought a piece of pottery to see if it was good, he'd hold it up to the sunlight. If that sunlight, he held it long enough, it would melt that wax and that wax would run out and they'd find out what he had was a crack pot. Have any of you ever met a crack pot besides me? And the, and the wax would run out. It would be a crack pot. And so what the Bible says, your life ought to be as a Christian, when you're hit with the sunlight of things, you're not, you don't have a crack in you. You're without a fence. You've lived your life in such a way, excuse me for saying this term, you're not a crack pot. You don't crack up when pressure comes in your life. You just say, okay, Lord, that's what you want. Okay, God. Let's go with this. All right, Father. That's what it means. Let's do it. That's exactly. You live your reputation as God wants you to live it. Now, wouldn't all of you have to agree with me? I've only got two more things to go. That all of us could live our life, want to live our lives better. If you're saved, I promise you. Now, if you're saved tonight, I promise you, you want to live a better life for Christ. Don't you? Now, if you're not saved tonight, you don't care. If you're saved tonight and backslidden, you probably don't care. I want to tell you something. If you're a saved person tonight, I know you want to live your life honoring to Christ without wax in your life. That's what he says. He wants you to live that way. Th fourth thing, look at verse 11 with me now. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, he wants us to pray about our works also. You know, there's a dirty word in Baptist churches. It's called works. Because we just want to just say, well, we're saved. And that's all that matters. But I want to tell you, if you're saved you ought to want to work for Christ. Faith without works is dead. Here's a verse of scripture. Ronnie Wright, so years ago, pointed this out to me. I don't think he even remembers it. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And Ronnie's pointed out to me one time. He said, preacher, if you notice that passage of scripture, there's not a comma, there's not a period at the end of verse number 9. There's a, there's a comma. Here's what it says. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of you said this is the gift of God, not of works that any man should boast. That's where we want to stop. He says, but we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus in the good work which God had before ordained we should walk in them. God said, if you've been justified by faith, there ought to be some works in your life that show you're saved. He prays for their good works. He prays for that. And then he prays that they live in the light of the coming of Christ. Look at verse number 10 with me, please, he would. He said, that you be sincere without offense to the day of Jesus Christ. I'll say this, and I'll say it as briefly as I can. I want Jesus Christ to come soon. I used to get so mad when we had preachers that come in here when I was a kid growing up, they're preaching the second coming of Christ, they'd make me mad because I still thought I had some ball games I wanted to play and I had some things I wanted to do. How many of you have ever watched a ball game and been disappointed? <laughs> you haven't watched Tennessee lately if you haven't. Yeah. But I'll tell you, you'll never be dis disappointed when you see Jesus Christ. Our works will do everything in the light of the coming of Jesus Christ. You know, come on, would we all live our lives a little bit different? And we don't know this. I could be totally off. I could be off for four minutes. If you knew within the next five minutes, Jesus Christ would come back again. Sure you would, wouldn't you? And I probably would too, or I would too. And we don't know he's coming in five minutes. He may come before then. Right? So the fact of the matter is, how do we live our lives? And the last thing. Verse number 11, under the glory and the praise of God. Everything we do, man, listen, listen to me. Here's a prayer he's praying for us. When I read all of these things here, I realize how much improvement I need. 
Can I get an amen? I realize how short I come of what I need to be in, in my life as well. Do I need to love more? Yes. Do I need to discern more? Yes. Do I need to, to, to discern more? Yes. Do I need to excel more? Yes. Do I need all these things I'm talking about? Yes. He said, I want you to do all things for the glory of God. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatsoever therefore you eat or you drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do it all for him. So tonight, we've been talking about praying. We've been talking about praying for one another. And I know tonight if I asked you if you need prayer, probably every hand in this room, every, every hand in this room would go up, we need prayer, all of us need prayer. Then if I were to ask you, do you know someone that needs to be prayed for? And I probably again would say, every hand in this room would probably go up and say, I know someone needs to be prayed for. We could probably do that tonight. And the wonderful thing is, is we have the opportunity to pray for others. As Paul prayed for this church here, what a wonderful opportunity we can do so. One thing in closing then, and we're going to baptize and have a brief invitation. Is you know, you say, well, pastor, I came tonight and I'm not even saved. I don't even know for sure if I died to go to heaven. Well, that's why prayer is important to you because the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus gives the illustration one time. He said, two men went to church. He said, one of them was a Pharisee. He gets in church and he says, oh, Lord, Lord. He said, oh, God, I'm so thankful I'm not like these other people over around here. Oh, God, I'm not like them. He said, oh, Lord. He said, I fast twice a week. And, Lord, I give you tithes. I, Lord, I do. Oh, Lord, I'm just such a great person. And God's sitting up in heaven. God's not a bit interested. Pride. God hates a proud look. Now, the Bible says there, that same church service, there's a man who's called a publican, not a republican, but a publican. And the Bible says he won't even lift his head toward heaven and he's smiting on his breast. He says, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Dr. Luke said that man went down to his house rather justified than the other man. Pray. If you need to seek God for salvation tonight, you ought to come and ask someone to take God's word so you can be saved, how you can know it. You ought to trust Christ tonight. Why should you do it tonight? Because today's the only day you have of salvation. Today's the only day. I trust I'd invite you to come tonight. Our heads are about, our eyes are closed. Could I just get you for a few minutes as we're, give a brief invitation here in just a few minutes. If you know you're saved tonight, you know Christ lives in your heart tonight and you're happy for that, would you say amen? I'm not going to look back. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to trick you and trap you. I'm going to come and talk with you. If the Spirit of God didn't speak to your heart about getting saved, I can't talk you into it. Anything I could talk you into, the devil could talk you out of. How many would simply raise a hand tonight with uplifted hand? You're saying, Pastor, I know tonight if I died, I'd go to heaven. If you know that tonight, would you raise your hand? And one more time, would you say amen with me? Amen. Now, if you couldn't raise your hand or if you couldn't say amen, why don't you get that settled before you leave this building tonight? We're not here uh, because we're better than you. I'm here because I got saved one day by the grace of God some 40-some years ago. And God, in His mercy, called me to preach. It's protected me these years and let me come and be a pastor these many years. And I'm here by the grace of God, the mercy of God, and because someone has prayed for me, and God's protected me. That's the only reason. If you're tonight and you don't know Christ as your Savior, why don't you come tonight and let someone take God's word so you can be saved, how you can know it.